she will be supported by Kelly Riddell, who is the principal of QRL, David Fisher, the vice principal, and Anthony McKay, the learning partner. Please come forward. Thank you very much for you, Chair. So uh, it's my pleasure to be here tonight with my colleagues uh, to provide the board with an update on the OYA Commercial Vehicle and Equipment Apprenticeship Program that was offered by TOVG in partnership with Kenpo Campus and Education Centre and our three coterminous boards of education. And to share some exciting news uh, that's uh, already been uh, mentioned tonight regarding the new adult training opportunities in the mode of trades that are being developed on site at Kenpo as a result of the funding that we secured from the Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development. And so I'm pleased to have with me tonight uh, key contributors to these programs. I'd like to recognize um, Ms. Shelley Riddell, who's our acting principal of Tier um, and she's joining us online tonight. We also have Mr. David Fisher, uh, Vice Principal of Tierra Leche with responsibilities for our Kenpo campus. And we have Mr. Anthony McCoy, our learning teacher and, um, and learning partner and teacher in the Commercial Vehicle and Equipment uh, Apprenticeship Program. I'd also like to mention uh, Tierra Leche uh, Principal Sandy McKinnis, who's not able to be with us this evening. And Principal McKinnis has really been integral to the development and the implementation of this program and in the work undertaken to secure the new adult programs that we'll share information about tonight. So, I have trustees, if we can move on to uh, slide three, please. Thank you. If you recall, trustees, I was with you at the board meeting October 27th of 2021, so just this past October, where I shared the background on how the Upper Canada Board and Tierra Leger came to be involved in community collaboration on Kempo campus. And so most of you are aware that for many years, Kempo uh, campus was affiliated with uh, the University of Guelph, and they were uh, have a long history of providing post-secondary apprenticeship training on the campus in Eastern Ontario. And when that uh, partnership was no longer uh, continuing, the municipality of North Grenville acquired the campus and they committed to renewing the campus under three foundational pillars. And they were education and training, economic development and health and wellness. So under the education and training mandate, in turn, four local school boards have come together with Kempo Campus uh, to pursue a variety of new and innovative opportunities for secondary school and for adults, uh, students in Eastern Ontario. And so there's, of course, ourselves, the Catholic School Board of Eastern Ontario, the Conseil des Écoles Publiques de l'Est de l'Ontario, and the Conseil des Écoles Catholiques de Saint-Est. So uh, as a four board partnership, there are a variety of different educational uh, opportunities being developed. For us, Tierra Leje assumed the lead role in the development of a commercial vehicle and, a, and equipment apprenticeship centre on Kempo campus. And our pilot program this year was an OYAP level one uh, commercial vehicle and equipment apprenticeship program that occurred between October 12th and December 17th. Next slide, please. So um, in our first program, we served 20 secondary students. Uh, from across the four partner boards, 11 of those students were Upper Canada students. And the students participated in theoretical and practical learning in an in-person format. Um, and a unique feature of the program was the interactive digital delivery of the theory portions, uh, because that isn't the norm within apprenticeship training as we understand it uh, in the province. And unique also because the practical applications of learning were only steps away on the shop floor from where the theoretical portions are being instructed. And so that one-stop shopping experience really provided great ease of access for students from Eastern Ontario. So as participants in the OYAP program, the students become registered in one of these three uh, mode of power trades, either agricultural technician, truck and coach technician, or heavy equipment technician and they enjoyed a total of 240 hours of in-class learning and that's broken down into 156 hours of theory and 84 hours of practical and when graduates complete the program they have achieved their level one certification in one of those three trades in order to pass the program uh, the student must hold a 70 percent average in all seven subjects in the program and uh, as I said, that the digital opportunity for the theory in a platform called Electude is really unique uh, to our program. And students, of course, are then you know, assessed on their knowledge and their practical skills. Next slide. 
So we're really proud of the students uh, from this first class, and we're pleased to share that uh, we had 100% graduation rate from the program with some really excellent results as are aligned here. The class average was 81%, and I think that speaks to the engagement of the students in the learning. And in our exit surveys with the students, they certainly told us how relevant and engaging the program was to them. The ability to learn the content in, the, in a module-based approach and to move seamlessly, as I said before, from that classroom space to the, in, with the theoretical learning to within steps away to the shop and the practical application was key in building the capacity of these students. Next slide, please. In addition, uh, the, there are, to the advantages of that single location for program delivery, we're also able to provide a great deal of wraparound supports for students in the OEAP program that might not be readily available in a traditional college model. Uh, our guidance, special education, and our steps, so our uh, uh, steps to employment uh, teachers, are available uh, within the campus to support students. Uh, the ease of integration of the accommodations for students with special education needs, right? Again, those staff are available to us right at the campus in the building. Individual and small group support for students who may need it, have needed reinforcement of theoretical components to find success, again, readily available because our teacher is on the premises, the students are there for the full day, and available for extra support, whether it be before class, at lunch, or after class. Uh, very similar to what we do in all of our high school settings, uh, and yet uh, it's not necessarily the norm in post-secondary uh, training uh, of this nature. So we really believe that these supportive aspects of our program delivery were a key factor to garner the support of the Ministry of Labor, Training, and Skills Development in approving our applications. Next slide. Our applications, of course, were to expand the mode of trades program opportunities to adults at our Kentville campus facility uh, because Tierra, it is Tierra Leger's adult mandate and continuing education mandate that was the driver uh, for our uh, applications. And so our um, recent successful applications uh, netted us uh, funding approximately $1 million. Next slide. So the new programs, what are they? So our first application was to the Skills Development Fund. And uh, the Skills Development Funding will allow us to offer programming to adult learners who are new to the motive uh, power trade sector. Um, and they may be looking to explore employment in the industry. And so participants under this funding envelope would have the opportunity to enroll in either an eight-week micro-credential program or in a 12-week full apprenticeship training. And these programs will allow adult learners to increase their knowledge and skills in preparation for long-term employment in these sectors, and with the added benefit with the 12-week program of experiential work placement within the industry. And so the total funding on that program was uh, just shy of $545,000. We also made application uh, for the Career Apprenticeship Fund, and we're successfully funded at uh, $377,163. And this program is targeted to support underemployed or unemployed adult learners with some knowledge and experience in the power mode of trades who are looking for apprenticeship certification or looking for second career opportunities. And the program allows individuals to try a trade by diving into the level one in-class training and completing subsequently 12 weeks of work placements across all three sectors so that then they're in a position to make a choice about what particular area that they would like to focus in as they move forward uh, in employment and potentially in uh, pursuing full apprenticeship certification. Next slide. In partnership with Kempo Campus, we were also successful in achieving training delivery status to provide level one apprenticeship training in the three mode of trades. And so agricultural equipment technician, heavy duty equipment technician, or truck and coach technician. And so this designation will allow us to purchase seats to provide uh, level one training uh, on an annual basis as the demand warrants. Uh, and these are uh, tuition-based programs, and this new TDA status also permits us to offer subsequent level two and level three training programs, uh, once again, as demand warrants. So the TDA 
position us to provide the full pathway for adults to achieve red seal apprenticeship uh, for candidates in eastern Ontario and, and beyond. It's certainly, uh, you know, our mandate has certainly been to target eastern Ontario, but we would welcome applicants from other places in the province as well. So next slide, please. Oh, sorry, we are already there. Thank you. Um, so as the restrictions related to COVID-19 have eased this spring, we've been able to develop some additional programs for secondary students. And we're currently offering two modules for students who are enrolled in either agricultural or transportation specialist high schools major programs. And so these modules are, one uh, is hydro hydraulic fluid power systems, and the second is practical electrical principles and diagnostics. And so we currently have 195 uh, UCBSB students who are scheduled to participate. Some have already completed, some upcoming, uh, with no charge to Upper Canada District School Board schools for their participation. And so we recognize as well an opportunity in the future to market these to other boards of education uh, for a fee. And on a go forward basis, it's certainly our intent to continue to work, uh, you know, with our uh, with our teaching and learning uh, department and uh, further opportunities for experiential learning uh, for intermediate and secondary students. And of course, these programs will be offered around the schedule and delivery of the fully funded adult programs in the shop. Next slide, please. So really, in summary, um, the OEAP Level 1 Apprenticeship Program for Commercial Vehicle uh, provided proof of concept that the Upper Canada uh, Tier Leger uh, program has the capacity to provide friendship training differently and it's a more supportive and accessible model for learners. And the Ministry of Labour and Training and Skills Development has recognized the strength and success of our OYAP Level 1 program and they've provided the necessary funding to ensure financial, financial sustainability to grow mode of trades, apprenticeship and training uh, on site with us uh, here in Eastern Ontario. And the year ahead is really going to allow us to further pilot our leadership role in creating futures uh, and via the apprenticeship training uh, opportunities on campus and, and through uh, our efforts. But to be clear, continuation of this programming beyond the 2022-23 school year will certainly be dependent on continued financial support to the current level from the Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development and of course on the local and provincial demand for these type of training opportunities. Um, but we're excited uh, with the work that we've been able to uh, engage this year and the results that uh, this team has, has brought uh, forward. And we're excited to, to engage in the expansion moving forward. And uh, we certainly look forward to a day where we might be able to uh, you know, enjoy uh, having some of our trustees come and, and visit the site and have a chance to, to see what's happening there. So uh, that concludes my presentation, and we're here, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Secretary Letters. Trustees, the floor is open for the questions. I can't see you if you're online. <coughs> Hold on a second. I'll start with uh, Trustee McPherson. Thank you. Uh, I'm probably the only one in this room that covets that tractor. <laughs> 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 but anyways, all I can say is, wow. Um, <coughs> CR Legge has always been near and dear to my heart as a trustee. And I'm absolutely blown away by the opportunities that this program presents. Um, I'll be honest with you, I read the trade papers, I read the farm papers. You see ads all the time looking for heavy equipment apprentices. The magic number seems to be that 310T. I think that's the most universal of the three delegate, three categories. But that is a real door opener. Uh, and I'm really, really proud of the Upper Canada Board for taking the lead on this. I do have a question though. Uh, when you say, you, you mentioned some programs there and numbers of UCDSB students. Are some of those programs specific to our students only? And I guess the follow up would be, when you say marketing to other boards, are you referring to co terminus boards or boards, say, Limestone, Renfrew, and let's get Gray County, let's get ambitious here? Um, 
So that's my two questions to you through the chair. So through you, Chair, and we've had a number of discussions about this. What's been challenging this year, of course, has been our circumstances related to COVID and the fact that we haven't had the same opportunities for field trips. And so while we would have liked to have started more of the experiential opportunities invitational to uh, local schools way back in January and February, schools weren't prepared at that point in time to travel and to come out. So we really were only able to start in about late early April, I guess. Um, we prioritized Upper Canada. Um, we put it out to some of our partner boards uh, within uh, the, like the four partner boards for our partnership with Kendall Campus, and there was a fee attached to those. But again, people were hesitant to be going very far afield in terms of, of training at that point in time. So I, it certainly would be our intention to market to also Ottawa Boards of Education and, and potentially um, the Lines Group Board as well and Renfrew. However, what we need to do now with the, you know, with the blessing of these new programs that are adult based and the funding that goes with them, our primary responsibility needs to be fulfilling our targets around that, those programs. And what we will do is we will fit everything we can for uh, secondary school students and experiential learning around when the shop is being used for those uh, adult purposes that we're fully funded. Thank you, Patty Jane. Thank you, through you, Chair. It was a great presentation, Susan. Thank you so much. This is, I think mean, it's going to be a phenomenal program. Um, my question is kind of different. Um, given that we are going to partner with our cultural news boards, but specifically the French boards, do we foresee that if we have some high school students that are in the immersion program, would they be able to benefit from our courses in the French language? So, through you, Chair. So all of the applications that went in for even the OEF level program were all, uh, our indicators were all that we would be offering because we're French boards and English boards coming together, we would be offering all of our programs in a bilingual format. And all of our online modules are fully bilingual. Uh, however, where we ran into a problem with our OEF program was we advertised, I believe, four or five times and could not secure a French instructor. So we found a workaround with our partners and we brought in a student success teacher from one of the French boards to support the French students in the program who were fully bilingual students and therefore learned in English but had the support of a French advisor as well. So that was our workaround in year one. Our new funding has put us in a position where we are going to, and I just spent uh, some time on the phone with our HR folks today, we're going to be looking at hiring uh, in addition to our English language instructor. Um, a fully French language instructor uh, for the program for next year um, because we have made that commitment that students in both English and French can be served and we do, uh, through these applications, we've budgeted for the cost of the, of the two instructors. That's phenomenal. Thank you. I do have a question and it concerns the, the community partnerships. Uh, do we have, is there a, an advisory board or advisory council of community uh, folks who are helping with this program? Not through you, Chair. So part of the uh, requirements under the OEAP uh, TDA was that we develop an advisory uh, committee uh, to help support the program, advise the program, and they were also really important folks to us because they were our connections to industry. Uh, is how we structured that team. So that advisory committee met regularly throughout the year. We've taken a pause over the last several months while we waited to determine uh, our success uh, on these applications. And so we're in a position where we're going to be reforming that advisory committee uh, in within the next several weeks to start again for the following year. Um, but I think at this point in time, we're obligated under the OEAP um, mandate to have an advisory committee. Uh, my intention is to create the advice to potentially expand the advisory committee somewhat so that they're advising not just on the OEF, which is a requirement, but on generally on the apprenticeship center as a well. whole. Thank you. I guess my second question. Sorry. No, uh, go ahead, John. Go ahead, go ahead. Dan, Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you, Chair, <clears throat> I, I want to echo uh, Trustee McPherson's comments. This is a wow day for. Upper Canada, the wonderful opportunity that this provides us. 
I, I guess what I, <clears throat> I, I have a question that is probably in the back of your mind a little bit too. It, it's servicing students from our end of the board. Um, that concerns me for everything. The, the opportunity is absolutely sensational. And I keep thinking, I was running through my mind as you were making your presentation, uh, Superintendent Rutters, that, gee, that would fit nicely in, in the eastern section, too, of, of our board in some of our schools that uh, could require. Is there any thought that maybe as time goes on, we plant the seed and we develop these wonderful programs, which I think for communities and for students and for uh, our area are absolutely stupendous. But, we, but uh, is there any thought that maybe at some point, if the seeds take place and the funding is there, that we could look at a program in the Eastern region to for our students? So through you, Chair, that's a really interesting question. And I think what's key to that question is around the funding. Uh, because what we discovered moving in to this is, is that we as a board um, made some investments up front to get this program off the ground in this year. We also recognized as we went through this year that in the absence of funding from the Ministry of Labor, Training and Skills and Development, that we as a board would not be able to sustain the scope of this project as a board of education, right? And, and you know, the, the director and I have had, you know, several conversations about our obligation as a K-12 public education institution and where our funding comes for that is for students to achieve their OSSD or adult students to achieve their OSSD. So the funding is key to sustaining the program that we've just created and certainly additional funding from the Ministry of Labor, Training and Skills Development outside of there being any radical changes on how they're funding apprenticeship and, and trades training in Ontario, I would suggest we would have to secure that similar funding in another spot. But I want to be clear though, we had students from all over the board access the program and there were through our, um, through our OEA yeah, um, budgets, we, we received some money to support transportation of students. So we had students from all over the board come. Similarly, the specialist high school's major uh, components that we've been doing, again, have been students from Glengarry, students from Cornwall, from CCBS, from St. Lawrence, uh, Charlan, Tugwa. And so when we're into those one day, two day training opportunities, and they're only cost because we've managed to sustain the program, is really to get there by bus for the day. Um, so there are opportunities in that regard too. But having it associated right in your own school, I agree would be a wonderful uh, opportunity. I think there's a lot of really good planning going on within our teaching and learning department around looking at uh, the trades and, and, uh, and technological education technology education for schools already though. Thank you. My second question is, um, could you tell us what the ratio is between male and female students? And um, what are you doing to attract female students to what is, I think, predominantly a male uh, you know, profession? So I'll speak a little bit to that, and then I'm going to turn it over to Anthony McCoy, who was our uh, instructor for the program. Um, what I can say is that some of the funding we secured uh, actually uh, highlights uh, particular um, demographics, and, and females are one of the demographics that they're looking for us to ensure that we can attract and we can support uh, their participation. Um, but I'm going to leave it to Anthony to talk about in the actual program we've already run, uh, how many, I think we So in this past fall or see that oh yeah, we had two female applicants in the actual program running. We had one who is actually currently employed and now she's offered employment halfway through the program. So that was a, a, a big plus for what we're promoting. In the new programs that we have that are schisms alone, I see the demographic from females to males is we're seeing about twenty percent of females coming to schism cases alone. So we're seeing a big uptake in the actual change in the demographic of the industry and then look at the industry as a whole a lot of the businesses themselves are actually being female run now as well so there, there's a big push that's happening right now and through you chair maybe i'll just i'm not sure whether you can speak at this point in time um 
a nice principal picture to we already have the list of applicants for our OEAP program for the fall. Do you yes. have any data with you on female versus male enrollment at this we point? We sent your four invitations up for female students for the program for this year. So out of the 25 seats, four have been uh, offered up to four. Or sorry, four. 20, 20 seats. seats yes. Four have been offered uh, to four applicants. Thank you. And so through you, Chair, just to kind of to finish that off, I think our OEAP coordinators are working really hard at the school level, and I'm sure that, that uh, Executive Superintendent Hardy, uh, you know, can speak to that uh, to ensure that we're we're you know generating that you know interest in the trades. You know, and there are some days that are put on by local colleges, that sort of thing. I'm not sure whether you want to speak further to that, um, Eric and Walter. Uh, through you, Chair. Yes, I mean, uh, I think a lot of the trustees will be aware of the traveling mobile labs we've had from St. Lawrence who've been attending schools and certainly I got a chance to visit. And uh, it was great to see uh, students, uh, you know, getting hands-on opportunities with that. And certainly I think those are opportunities for us to maybe put some things in front of students that they might not be thinking about otherwise. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we have in mind moving forward is just the importance of promoting apprenticeships going forward. I think there are probably a lot of students and a lot of parents who are not aware that you can get training for free and move very quickly, as we've heard, into really high paying jobs uh, right out of school without the expense of post-secondary education. And of course, it's incredibly attractive. And we know from the province, I think they're saying one in five jobs in the next uh, 20 years is going to be based on skilled trades. And so uh, this is clearly a, a growth area, and I know trustees are very much aware of this, and this is something that we've been talking about a lot uh, in our conversations about the program for next year as well. Thank you. I have a question for uh, Anthony. I want to hear about this new truck. <laughs> so again, working with industry partners, there's a, there's a huge push from local industry in our area to support the growth of trades. So when I came on last May, I worked with Rush and kind of so their national leadership. And through the, the work means so they were able to donate a 2019 unused, fully new truck from Navistar head office in Las Vegas. Uh, the truck of the only for the sum is like $150 some odd thousand dollars. Uh, right and they donated to the program. Then they've also got a, a huge raise of other items donated, I think. In total, Rush themselves is like that like two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars worth of donations. Thank you. Uh, could you please bring up that last second last slide with the picture of the tractor? That's <laughs> <laughs> for you, Bill. The picture of the tractor is coming up for you. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to point out here, Anthony. You may have made a you may have made a mistake uh, that day. Because I was in the driver's seat and you forgot to take the key out. <laughs> I can't tell you how poised I was to fire it up and get her going. Your superintendent, right in front of the window. Right. <laughs> well, she would have moved fast. <laughs> she would have. Anyway, uh, Anthony and David, and thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. And uh, I, I wish you uh, ongoing success. Thank you. Yes, question. No? I just have one comment, and I don't want this opportunity to pass. And it has nothing to do with this, but it has a lot to do with the success of the students. A few years ago, my son was at SFDCA, and he came up with this weird idea of driving his phone bill along with a whole bunch of others um, of his friends into the high school. And he asked me about it, and I said, you have to ask somebody in the head office. So they sat down with Mr. Fisher here, and they reached an agreement, and he had some strict rules and guidelines. But you should have seen those six kids. They were so proud when they slid all these sleds up in a snowbank near the bus lot at the high school. They were so proud. It absolutely made their winter. I want to thank you. I've never seen you since, but I want to thank you for that. Also, it's a great thing. Also, I've been safe jobs this as well, so we mapped out the safe and as possible to go. And we mapped out the, yeah. the parking of yeah, the students. It was a pleasure. Tractors and snowmobiles. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to move on. Thank you very much. Um, as you know, trustees, we have a, an agreement with uh, between uh, the Canada District School.
Mohawk Board of Education. And uh, I think I'm going to turn this over to uh, Mohawk Board of Education. And I think I'm going to turn this over to uh, Superintendent, uh, Executive Superintendent Eric Hardy. And I welcome also Kathy Grant, Principal of Indigenous Education. So, carry on. Uh, great. Uh, thank you to you, Chair. Um, Kelsey and I are happy to uh, join you this evening. Uh, you'll be seeing us a couple of times actually this month because we'll be back uh, in a couple of weeks at the Bappy, so we'll have a lot more information about uh, some of the really great things that we've uh, been up to. Uh, today, uh, we're here to uh, speak about the uh, agreement that we have with Andy. Again, I think most trustees will be well aware that we've had a long standing and an incredibly positive relationship with our friends from Hong and of course, this is uh, where the position that uh, Trustee Jacobs uh, has comes from as part of this agreement. Uh, the agreement uh, that uh, is, a, is a five year agreement and it comes up in August. And so we're here coming today with a recommendation. Uh, thanks, Lisa. So, as you can see, uh, uh, obviously, there's been, a, 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 I think, a really uh, wonderful uh, relationship between the boards, and it's something that I think uh, we we all um, cherish and, and has been a really positive example of, of relationships between the two communities. Um, uh, you will be aware, I'm sure, that the majority of students from uh, ANS, which is the Office of the Mohawk School, uh, come to CCBS for uh, high school. In fact, we're offering a reach ahead credit, which you'll hear a little bit more about next time. Sorry, Kelsey, I'm already stealing your thunder. Mm -hmm. uh, and the vast majority of the grade eights uh, were attending uh, AMS are actually in a reach ahead credit with us at the moment, which will help um, smooth their transition to CCBS for um, students attend. And uh, trustees will also note that there was a, a draft agreement that was attached uh, to your agenda for this evening as well, uh, with uh, just one very, very minor uh, change, which we'll talk about here on the next slide. So just uh, generally, uh, in terms of the finance piece, I know there's a couple of questions we had from trustees about how that works. And, and so effectively what happens is uh, AMBI pays us uh, an amount. The amount varies uh, year over year, and that's determined by the province. And it's the equivalent of what we would get in terms of GSMs for uh, our uh, non ambi students as well. And as the numbers from Andy go up and down, like all the other students we have, uh, obviously the staffing allotment at CCPS adjusts. And so the size of the staffing complement uh, for the students coming from uh, AMS and from Andy is obviously sort of ratio to the number of students there. And then on top of that, in the agreement, uh, we have uh, two, uh, there's four positions in total, and the staff who work at CCDS to support the students from the community. And so we pay for two of them to a cost of about $130,000 a year, uh, and Andy picks up the other two. And that comes from our Indigenous Education budget, which is a little over uh, $6 million. Um, the only minor change uh, in the agreement, which Andy proposed and makes a lot of sense, was that it also suggested that uh, in the agreement that we would cover the costs of a, a psychological associate. But in fact, Andy has been paying for that for the last number of years. And so uh, Donna, the director from Andy, suggested that that would come out of the agreement. Uh, but otherwise, uh, Andy was uh, happy with the agreement. and relationship, obviously, that we have with them. As you will hear when we come back with Bappy next week, again, I'm not going to see more of your thunder here, Kelsey, but uh, we've got a lot of good things going on, and uh, also uh, trustees will be aware that there's an option to go and see what's some, some of that next week uh, on, the, on the 18th of May. Yes. yes. Yeah. Week from today, yeah. It seemed like a long time away at one point, but yes, next week, so there'll be an opportunity to come and see uh, some of that programming. And so uh, they said we move to the final slide. And so the, uh, the recommendation from us is that we would uh, enter a new five-year agreement uh, with the uh, Akwesasi Mohawk Board of Education as per the draft, which is, which is attached. Uh, and it's uh, been expressed to us by uh, Director Lahash that that's certainly the preference of Andy and Grand Chief to enter another five-year agreement. And uh, we have uh, clarified, just for the record as well, with the province that it is up to us and Andy to determine the length of an agreement and what that looks like. And so the province has made clear that we are uh, permitted, as it were, from a provincial level to sign another five year agreement with them. Uh, if this recommendation is approved this evening, then we would proceed to arranging a uh, signing ceremony and a chance for us to bring the two, uh, the two boards together. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, happy for any uh, questions. Do you have uh, any questions that you'd like to ask? Do you know why it's still open? Here we go. 
any questions from the trustees online? No? All right. Uh, Kelby, before you leave, I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk about it next Wednesday. <laughs> well, thank you. There's the 33 to 35 students from CCS who are AMI students. So we'll head out on Tuesday and stay overnight, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and return Thursday. And then we'll have some visitors, um, some people come and visit us on Wednesday. But uh, it's a cultural camp. So we'll be doing, students will, be, will earn a credit for their time over there. And the credit will be a, a, an Indigenous you know, um, cultural credit. And we'll be doing things like on Tuesday night, we'll be setting night lines and catching sturgeon, hopefully. So, we'll be, <laughs> hopefully, because we'll be hungry on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> so, Wednesday, we'll be um, doing fish cleaning, um, smoking fish, traditional cooking. So, when you come to visit, you will see us. Uh, we'll make the kids work for their dinner. So, they'll be doing things like um, grinding corn to make corn bread and corn milk mush. Mm. Um, we'll be outdoor cooking, um, doing traditional meals, doing medicine walks. So we'll go through the, through the forest and um, harvest a lot of plants and bring them back and use them as part of our meals. Uh, storytelling at night, they'll learn how to start fires. Um, there's a lot of a lot of really great things planned, and it's we're really excited. And I know that the kids won't care, but I really hope the sun shines. <laughs> <laughs> I know there are quite a number of trustees who are planning and attending, so we, yeah. we are looking forward to it. So thank you. Uh, before we leave this topic, we have a motion, <laughs> which is the purpose of this event item. I have a motion moved by the Vice Chair Cram, seconded by Trustee Jacobs, if that's okay. Yes, that's fine. The Upper Canada District School Board approved the draft five year term agreement. As presented May 11, 2022, between the Office of Austin Mohawk Board of Education and the Upper Canada District School Board. This agreement made this first day of September 2022 to the 31st day of August 2027. Are there any questions? Seeing none, please cast your ballots online. Mm -hmm. That motion carries. So, uh, executives of the party, thank you. And okay. thank you very much. I'm going to move to 1003, which is financial forecast number three. The ball over to Mr. Hobbs, executive secretary of the Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's uh, my pleasure this evening, uh, as you said, to bring forward financial forecast number three, which is obviously the third in the sequence of uh, three financial forecasts that we bring you throughout the course of the year. Um, just to give you sort of the uh, executive summary or the close notes version of the presentation, uh, financial forecast number three projects revenues of $400 million for this year, which is the first time that our organization has pierced that threshold, I think, in its history. Expenses of $399 million for compliance purposes that would result in an updated projected in year surplus of $1 million for compliance purposes at August 31st, 2022. The change, as you recall, back in we did financial forecast number two at that time, we were projecting a $1.4 million surplus at year end. And obviously, $1 million is down a bit from that projected surplus, and that's primarily related to a decrease in the anticipated transportation surplus as a result of higher fuel costs that uh, we're all unfortunately acquainted with uh, as we uh, global air daily business. Um, the forecast also, as you'll see, includes a number of system and school investments, such as uh, a big investment in technology for students and staff, classroom furniture sets, uh, investments in uh, technological education programs. Really, the thrust of this is designed to accelerate us out of the sort of COVID pandemic posture that we've been in for two years 
and uh, resume and in fact catch up to some investments that we probably ordinarily would have made had we were not been dealing with COVID over the course of the last few years. Uh, what we would say about those COVID related expenses is those have mostly stabilized since the Omicron variant uh, emerged back in December uh, and they're completely manageable within the COVID funding provided by the Ministry of Education. So um, we're happy to present, I think, what we'll see to be a positive outlook for the end of the school year. Uh, so what would a finance presentation be without this uh, with the, this slide? And it really, it's a reminder, it's a reminder to myself, in fact, that uh, oftentimes through the course of the year, the finance department and uh, you, of course, are dealing with managing three different fiscal years at any one time. We're always managing what's happening in the current year, which is represented by the top bar. Uh, we're uh, sometimes in the fall heavily dealing with closing out the previous fiscal year. And of course, at this time of year in the spring, we're also uh, dealing with a series of presentations on the next fiscal year, 22-23. However, tonight, I just really want to emphasize, uh, again, primarily from my own memory, is that we're dealing right now with a forecast for where we're going to end up in this current year. So this isn't about budget 2022-23. This is really about how we're ending up. We see ourselves ending up this year uh, at the end of August. <coughs> Um, one thing I would just want to point out is that uh, trustees may recall that this year uh, we've done something a little bit different than uh, with financial forecasts. So um, in the history of our board, since we've been adopting this three financial forecast model, uh, th those financial forecasts typically occurred in the January, uh, April and June timeframe. Uh, but what we did this year is we moved those forecasts up. So the first financial forecast this year happened at the end of October. Uh, the um, financial forecast number two happened in March, and here we are at the beginning of May uh, doing financial forecast number three. And the intention of moving those up in the year was A, to give you better visibility early in the school year about uh, material changes that would occur to revenue or expenses uh, as we got into the start of the new school year and after the original budget was passed. And the second piece of it was is to give you uh, earlier uh, intelligence throughout the course of the year, particularly at the end of the year, uh, for how we were doing so that if it was needed to make adjustments, either because things were going better or more poorly than we might have planned, that we would have the opportunity to make uh, adjustments, ideally in a way that would not be sort of catastrophic. And I think that um, speaking on behalf of the finance department, we found that actual move up of the schedule to be quite useful in our ability to um, sort of recommend and adjust to changing financial conditions as they emerge. Next slide, please. I can catch up with my paper here. This is really, really a bit traumatic for me to have this much paper. Uh, so the back, a little bit of background, just as a, by way of reminder, uh, we obviously last year, June 2nd, 2021, we presented uh, an original budget and trustees passed that budget. At that time, we were projecting for the current year, 21-22, we would end the year with a $400,000 surplus. And at that time, you'll recall as well, owing to the fact that we are still in the midst of the COVID pandemic, we again included a, a contingency reserve in our uh, proposed budget to support the ongoing COVID response uh, if it was needed. Uh, on October 27th, as I mentioned, we, we presented you with financial forecast number one. And at that time, we the forecast year-end surplus had grown to 700000 uh, largely due to increased enrollment compared to the spring projections that informed our original estimates for 21-22. On January 22nd, or 26th, I'm sorry, uh, a little earlier than I even mentioned earlier, we presented financial forecast number two. Uh, and at that time, as I mentioned, we uh, uh, forecasted an increased year-end surplus of $1.4 million. And again, there was a little bit of a decline in projected enrollment at that time, but also a significant increase in the, in the anticipated transportation surplus. And uh, the purpose of this presentation, of course, is to give you the third and final forecast for this year, which we'll get into right away. So the detail. Next slide, please. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so this slide you're familiar with, and the intention of this uh, slide is to show you uh, beginning with the original budget for 21-22 that we passed on June 2nd, how our projections for revenue and expense have evolved over the course of the year through original budget, financial forecast number one, number two, and now number three. And what you see if you look along the top row in terms of revenue, original budget last year projected $383 million in total revenue. 
and that grew successively through successive financial forecasts to $395.1 million, $398.8 million, and now uh, $400 million, driven in large part really uh, by uh, changes in enrollment and additional grant uh, activity from the Ministry of Education. And, you know, when we do, uh, being a public sector institution, uh, expenses also grew correspondingly. So back when we had the original budget, second row here, which says total expenses for compliance. As you can see, in the original budget last year, we forecasted $382.6 million in expenses. And no surprise, being a public sector institution, when we get additional revenue, it's expected that we're going to spend it uh, in accordance with the intended purpose for which it's provided. And so what you see is our expenses creeping up uh, alongside those uh, those increases in revenue to where we are forecasting today, uh, total expenses for this year, 399.0 million. And of course, if you take revenue and subtract the expenses, that gives you your annual surplus and deficit for compliance. And what you see in the bottom row there is the evolution of our forecasted surplus and deficit, which has gone from 400,000 to 700,000 to 1.4 million and then now down a bit to 1.0 million. And uh, what we'll do next is then talk a little bit about what the key drivers for that uh, $400,000 change in uh, surplus from financial forecast number two, uh, where that comes from. Next slide, please. So the main contributors to this, to the uh, that $400,000 variance compared to financial forecast number two, uh, first of all, what we see here is that in row one, GSN and tuition fees and related expenses, we see a favorable change of 3.7 uh, million. And so what you see happening there is we see uh, about $0.9 million increase in revenue uh, due to higher uh, enrollment projections and use of some deferred revenue that we pulled in to support uh, online learning uh, this year. Uh, and we also see a $2.8 million decrease in expenses. And you know, what I'll do in explaining the $2.8 million, million decrease in expenses is just refer back to my earlier comments that we carried a, in the original budget for this year, we carried a contingency reserve that was out of regular board funding that was intended to support uh, ongoing COVID expenses should they arise throughout the course of the year. And what we found as a result of the evolution of the pandemic itself and also additional funding that the ministry provided, we didn't need to tap into that that those those COVID expenses or that COVID contingency reserve. So what you're seeing there is a is a favorable variance in the sense that we didn't have to incur that those costs for COVID and therefore those funds were uh, available to us to apply in other areas. The second row you'll see is school what we call school and system inv investments. And so this I think really represents a good news and a good uh, signal that we've uh, been able to adapt uh, as changing uh, circumstances and particularly additional funding from the government and a reduced uh, lower than expected need to tap into COVID contingency funds a bit. So we're putting $4.4 million into uh, uh, investments that really directly impact the school and as I said earlier are going to help us accelerate out of the uh, pandemic uh, in response to some of the changes that we see um, being sustained on the horizon, but also to catch up with things that we uh, uh, would have done had we had we um, uh, made those investments in the last couple of years. And I'll get into this a little bit further, but this includes uh, significant investment in technology, including computers to, to uh, refresh the current uh, inventory devices. Uh, we're looking at uh, replacing some phone systems in schools to bring them up to modern standards to enhance communication and safety within schools so that people can communicate about what's going on in school. Uh, looking at a very significant investment in classroom furniture to uh, replace um, suites of classroom furniture that is aging and tired with furniture that's more modular and reconfigurable to accommodate different uh, kind of classroom configurations. And then also a very significant upgrade of uh, investment in um, shop uh, equipment uh, to support uh, technological education programs like uh, wood shop and auto shop and so on. Uh, line three, um, what you see here is an unfavorable variant. So um, this is really reflective of higher than anticipated fuel costs associated with transportation. Again, no surprise to anybody who, uh, as all of you do, drive a car to get here. Um, Line four, uh, what we see is a favorable variance uh, in school budgets. And what that means essentially is that schools are planning on spending approximately $600,000 less than we had forecasted out of their own budgets. 
and I can talk to you a little bit about that uh, further on a subsequent slide. And then we have the uh, inevitable catch-all slide, other revenue and expense changes amounting to $200,000 uh, favorable. And so if you add all those things up, it comes to a negative variance compared to financial forecast number three of $400,000, which is why our projected surplus has gone from $1.4 million to $1 million. Moving on to the next slide. So this is where we just like to highlight, I think, some of the good news stories that uh, we have occurring in here with regard to some pretty significant investments that are occurring in the system. First of all, uh, what we, one thing we did want to highlight is in the budget, the uh, government announced about $2.2 million for the Upper Canada District School Board in tutoring supports that are going to be provided for, through the Ministry of Education, PPFs. And uh, even though this was really, the budget typically speaks to uh, things that are going to happen in our next fiscal year, uh, the government has actually asked us to split that spend between our fiscal year. So half of it, $1.1 million, will be spent in uh, the 21-22 fiscal year on tutoring supports, with the second half, $1.1 million, being spent in 22-23. So that's a very uh, significant investment, and Executive Superintendent Hardy and his team are already working on how to mobilize that, that funding to support the needs of our kids, again, with the theme of accelerating out of the pandemic. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a uh, very significant investment in technology refresh. So uh, 2,000 uh, desktop and monitor bundles, uh, 200 portable laptop storage charging carts to supplement. Uh, I don't know if uh, you're aware of how many actual devices we purchased over the course of the pandemic uh, to support the remote learning thanks to the government's uh, funding, but uh, 5,000 additional laptops will be coming in plus those additional 2,000 um, and our, my team is already working on refurbishing those 5,000 laptops that we acquired over the last two years, and those will be being deployed to schools, which will represent about almost 50% of our device fleet being uh, updated over the course of the period of the year. Uh, we're also trying to address uh, equitable access to technology in schools with increased enrollment, so we know that there's been some pretty uh, roller coaster rides for some schools over the past couple of years uh, with regard to changes in enrollment and it's our plan to use this to level out that so there's equitable device access across schools for students and one of the other things that we're seeing is that there's a whole category with our uh, last couple of years reliance on technology a whole category of employees who need better access than they've got to technology and so that includes occasional teachers, educational assistants, and early childhood educators. And we're uh, going to be buying with 350 laptops that can be signed out to those people so that if teachers are uh, off sick and they're used to using a piece of software with their class and they have an, an occasional teacher come in, that person doesn't have to, you know, they can keep going with the work of the teacher because they'll have access to a, a device that they can pick up on their way into school. As I mentioned earlier, uh, replacing almost 70 classroom furniture sets. So this is entire class sets of furniture as opposed to a desk here and a desk there. Uh, and I know the senior team is working with the purchasing department on where, there, where those are to go, but hopefully what we're gonna see is students and communities will see tangible improvement in the condition of some of their uh, classrooms and schools. A half million dollar investment in equipment and tool upgrades for technological education programs like auto welding and carpentry. And what I hope I think will be uh, the uh, start of a more sustained multi-year strategic investment in making sure those uh, programs are up to date. As I mentioned earlier, replacing some antiquated office phone systems for improved safety and communication. And then of course, uh, one thing I think I have mentioned in previous financial forecasts is since the original board budget was passed in, on June 2nd, we've also actually flowed an additional $1.4 million directly into school budgets for uh, all purposes. Um, at the discretion of the principal. And so with that huge infusion of uh, funding in the course of a year, it's no surprise, as I mentioned earlier, that there, there may be a little bit unspent at the end of the year. Um, so there's been a very big infusion in school budgets this year, partially as a result of giving schools access to previous year's surpluses that they had accumulated. <laughs> Um, again, you know, we really don't want to disappoint you by not having our little gas gauge um, um, <laughs> slide on here. So, uh, but what we, one of the things that I think is really interesting is that, um, you know, the Ministry of Education, as we'll talk about during budget, they have so many constraints over the nature of the funding that they flow our way. The actual act of establishing a budget is really, a, in a lot of ways, a compliance exercise to demonstrate to the Ministry of Education that we've checked all the boxes and, and we've spent things in the right way. And so 
Um, you know, what they're looking for is that we're not running a deficit, that if we had to run a deficit, which we would have had to talk to them about in advance, that it wouldn't exceed a compliance threshold and that we're spending appropriately on administration and governance. And I'm confident to say that we're well, well within those bounds and checking all those boxes. One thing I did want to highlight for you, though, is as you uh, get into the weeds a little bit, um, I, I've spoken about this, as particularly in the context of COVID. Um, boards technically are allowed to run deficits, provided they have the accumulated surplus available to cover it. But it's only limited to 1% of their operating allocation. So in a typical year, that would be, for us, between 3 and $4 and $4 million. Throughout the course of the COVID pandemic, as you recall, the ministry allowed us a bigger compliance threshold. So they would allow us to spend in the deficit up to 2% of our operating allocation, provided we crossed a, a series of, uh, sort of, we jumped through a series of hoops, if you will, or met a series of criteria. And this is the last year they're going to allow that to happen. So for 22 23, our compliance threshold is going back to 1%, which means less uh, deficit spending capability going forward. But we don't see that being a big pressure point. Next slide, please. And as you know, uh, there, the in-year surplus uh, that we're, we've been talking about tonight, uh, projected to be $1 million, is how we're going to end the 22-23, uh, or the, sorry, the 21-22 school year. And when we're done the 21-22 school year, whatever surplus we have at the end of the year gets added to our accumulated surplus, which is the sum total of all surpluses and deficits that we've run each year for the history of the war. So this, this shows how that accumulated surplus will be affected. And as you'll recall, the accumulated surplus for the board consists of two major parts. There's a, a part that's available for compliance, and there's a part that's unavailable for compliance. Uh, and that part that's unavailable for compliance is, is, we call it externally appropriated because it's subject to constraints that the board is not allowed to touch. And so our position, I'll start with row four here in this uh, this slide, which is the totally externally appropriated part, because uh, we can't touch that. So um, 14 points, at, as of September 1st, 2021, we were at $14.7 million in an externally appropriated uh, surplus. Um, a lot of that, as you'll recall, has to do with school generated funds. So as distinct from school budgets, school generated funds are the amounts that school councils might raise through fundraising activity uh, and so on. Uh, so that's a, that's a major part of it. And uh, obviously that can't be folded into our regular board budget. That is reserved and externally appropriated for those uses. That, that, externally, or that externally appropriated accumulated surplus, we're forecasting to grow by 0.5 million or $500,000 this year, largely as a result of the fact that schools have resumed operations and what you're seeing is more school generated fund, AKA fundraising activity happening in schools. So last couple of years, we've had a bit of a decline there as a result of less fundraising activity, but that's resumed. And so you're seeing that grow a little bit, anticipated growth to $15.2 million at the end of the year. The other major part of our accumulated surplus uh, is the part that's available for compliance. And it itself is composed of two pieces. The first piece is the internally appropriated part. And that largely consists of or that does consist of funds that the board itself has put constraints on. Uh, and as a way, by way of example, uh, school budgets are an example of internally appropriated funds. So uh, what you see, ha and uh, other examples would be funds that UCLC, for example, has accumulated over the years, uh, or Champions for Kids has accumulated over the years. It falls into that internally appropriated or internally restricted bundle. So as of September 1st, 2021, we had $9.7 million in that uh, amount. And what you see, uh, we're expecting it to decrease by 700,000 or $0.7 million. And what this is, is it's a reflection of the fact that we've given schools the okay to spend their previous year's surplus. In other words, they're drawing down surpluses that they had accumulated up to the end of August 31st, uh, 2021. And that's really what you see happening there. So at the end of the year, the totally, the internally appropriated portion of our surplus available for compliance will be down by about 700,000 or, or uh, down by 700,000 to 9 million. The final piece of our accumulated surplus available for compliance is essentially unrestricted, uh, really no restrictions on it at all. And uh, September 1st, 2021, there was about $8 million uh, sitting there uh, in that accumulated surplus. 
Uh, we're expecting that to grow by $1.7 million uh, to a total of $9.7 million. And so what you see, I think, happening there is largely a result of uh, a transportation surplus that is uh, occurring. So not just steel, but it also, we're, we're given transportation funds and a, the bulk of it goes to steel. But what we've seen happen is there's other elements of our transportation funding that we use for funding field trips and so on. And what you see happen is that there's there's quite a lot of uh, there's been quite a lot less activity this year than we might normally have, which is a contributor to that uh, transportation surplus as well. So I know it can be confusing, but if you take the 1.7 million dollar increase to the operating surplus in line one, you subtract off the 700,000 decrease in line two, you end up with our year-end surplus of a million dollars, right? So. Parts gone up, parts gone down, the total is a million dollar increase. Financial forecast number three anticipates a $1 million in year surplus. And again, that's a decrease from what we had forecasted in uh, financial forecast number two. Good news is COVID related expenses have remained predictable since the Omicron variant. And in fact, uh, coupled with additional funding that we've received, we've had to tap into less uh, COVID contingency than we had thought, which has liberated funds for us to make investments in other areas, such as technology for students and staff, classroom furniture, uh, improved communication systems, and investments in technological education uh, programs. Uh, we see some uncertainty uh, between now and the end of the fiscal year, uh, of course, uh, but really I think that uh, we see things as being mostly stable uh, and what we, we will expect to see, uh, this is the last forecast you'll be expected to see with the definitive results coming in fall of 2022 uh, with the actual financial audit and financial statements, which you should see in November or December. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hobbs. Trustees, do you have any questions? Trustee McPherson? Uh, perhaps not directly related to your presentation, but when you replace classroom furniture, is there an effort made to recycle what we're not going to use in well, to you, Mr. Chair, yeah, we, we actually try to uh, look at what's salvageable and uh, see if there's another use for it. Uh, to be candid with you, usually what we're replacing is in the, the kind of condition that it's really not that salvageable, but we do definitely look through it and pick through things that we can make available to other schools should be right. Trustee McDonald? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, my question is related to um, the, surplus the surplus that we're looking at. So yeah. one million surplus. In, in we we from point four down to one million, um, and I think a lot of that hard work is, is the investment into the uh, the supplies um, that that are required. So classroom furniture and computers and, and things like that. What? Um, and here, let me give you the backstory on, on why I'm asking this. <clears throat> is, you know, we have a motion on the books and a resolution that says we want to have our accumulated surplus that's available and not externally appropriated uh, at a certain level. And, you know, that we're in that level, uh, even though we have some of it that's internally appropriated. The one thing, and, and I think we should still look at, at contributing to that and having that healthy. Uh, surplus because that will be the thing that helps us if we get into trouble in any given year. But the thing with the surplus is that when we contribute to that this year, so that $1 million goes into the surplus. And if we get into trouble next year, it's not like we can pull it out, right? We have to run a deficit and then we, we draw out that surplus for the following year. So that it's a little complicated on how it works. It's not like a you know, the old days when we had reserve funds where we could actually have an operating reserve pull funds out from, from one month to the next. Uh, with public sector accounting, um, it, it's a little bit different and, and we need to be cautious on um, how we have our surpluses set up. Some of them should be more internally appropriated. We potentially should talk about that in the future, won't do that today. 
But what I look at when I look at the million dollars, if we're going to go into uh, add that to the surplus, we've done a lot of work to to buy um, some goods that are are benefiting students today. And you know, when, whenever Superintendent Hobbs talked about the ability for us to move everything forward by a little bit, um, it's really given us the opportunity and the luxury to be able to respond much, much uh, more quickly. And you know, here we are in May, knowing that we potentially have a surplus that's going to be added to uh, for, for the uh, for the fiscal year. That fiscal year doesn't end until August 31st. But I think there's an opportunity for us to potentially draw down that surplus a little bit more, um, knowing that we've got some additional funds right now and use those funds in the same areas that um, Superintendent Hobbs talked about, sorry, Executive Superintendent Hobbs talked about, around school uh, and technology. And so that back in um, back story a little bit uh, comes to the question of, for Executive Superintendent Hobbs, if we were to give you um, in administration, um, you know, a mandate to say, please access an additional 500,000 of that 1 million surplus to help uh, augment and spend um, for school and, and technology, would we be able to do that this year? Um, to you, Mr. McDonald, I think, uh, Trustee McDonald, I think uh, I think we'd have to have the conversation with the senior team to say what are the priorities of the senior team. Uh, and then the second thing is, from a practical standpoint, I'd have to go talk to a manager of purchasing, Brad Notman, to see what we can actually get through the supply chain in the time available. But I think if that was the direction of trustees, we'd make our level best effort. I mean, there's lots of areas I think of need and opportunity in our schools to, to support schools. And maybe the director has through you mr chair uh yeah so when you when executive superintendent hobbs uh, presented some of the areas that we're going to spend i'm sure trustees noticed that those reflect uh the information that we had through our accountability framework and the priorities the trustees said that they wanted to see uh, one of those is around uh, our tech classes and updating those and uh you know it's, it's half a million dollars which is significant but as you can imagine, with some of the equipment that we have in those shops, that goes pretty quickly. It doesn't take too long to spend that money, uh, and those shops are in need of that. And that certainly was identified by trustees as a priority. Another major priority identified by trustees was to embrace uh, real-world learning and project-based learning experience, uh, learning uh, to get away from uh, or give more opportunities so it's not, uh, not so heavily focused on textbooks and paper copies. Uh, so the investment in uh, technology and computers is certainly going to help with that. And as is refreshing our classrooms, it's one thing to say we want students to have opportunities to work in groups and to plan activities. Uh, but if everybody are in those desks that uh, our stu two student trustees might remember still be sitting in, where the desk is attached by a metal bar to the seat and you can't move it, those are incredibly difficult to move around when you're trying to uh, be flexible in a classroom setting. So you'll see that the areas that were identified were all areas that reflect uh, what trustees have told us that they want to see uh, happening in our schools and to trustee uh, executives sorry to executive superintendent uh, Hobbs's uh, point certainly there's more that can be done there particularly in the in the shop classes but the question becomes uh, you know can we do that within the timelines because as I think trustees probably are aware that has to actually be purchased and delivered uh, and received by us before the end of August for it to count for uh, this year's budget. So that would be the challenge, um, but certainly uh, there there are more things uh, that uh, we could do for our schools in line with the guidance that trustees have given us about what they want to see us doing in our schools. Mr. Chair, may I have a follow-up? Yes, Adam. Uh, I, and I appreciate that, and I, and I think that's those are those are um, important pieces of information. So you know, I know that the time frame is tight, um, but would it help? And I asked for direction from the chair um, and the director. You know, would it help if we put a motion forward tonight that would say, you know, it exudes some effort to determine whether we um, can, um, you know, get additional supports around the school and system uh, investment side of things or wherever it might be. I understand that it can't be a recurring cost, it would have to be a, a fixed cost. Um, for this year, but is, is there an opportunity for us to do that by motion tonight to say, 
you know, let's let's move forward to determine if we can move the uh, surplus estimated surplus uh, to be closer to 500,000. Would that be beneficial to administration um, and through your chair to Mr. to the director, I guess? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Always knowing what the will of the board is is very helpful. Uh, you know, we would do our level best to, to meet the timelines. It's not a matter of just spending money to spend money. There are certainly needs out there. Uh, it, would, it would come down can we meet the timeline. Uh, as you've heard and you've seen with the executive superintendent Hobbs since he's taken over this portfolio, we strive to be, uh, you know, within within the budget limits and to be good stewards of the money that's allocated. Uh, and that's why you see that there is this money. If it's the will of this board that we uh, access more of those funds, that certainly would be beneficial to our schools and our students and help with the plans that we have uh, moving forward with the uh, board work plan and the director's work plan uh, for next year. It's it's uh, it puts the tools in place that we need to achieve some of those lofty goals that will be uh, presented at the next meeting. Um, just to put this in perspective, uh, Trustee McDonald, correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, in June, we passed the budget with uh, a $400,000 projected surplus. Now, on forecast number three, we are saying that surplus is going to be in the order of $1 million. So what you are saying, Trustee McDonald, is the difference between, say, 0.4 and 1, so 500 or 600,000, which would be available. Uh, and I, I frankly haven't support such a motion, frankly, because we have our strategic plan. From that strategic plan, uh, we have the director's work plan, which has yet to be presented for, uh, it will be presented in May. If we were to pass such a motion tonight, then it would give the director a more clear uh, direction and picture as to what he can or cannot do with his own plan and the plan of his staff. Do I have that right? Absolutely, Mr. Chair, and, and I think you've got the foundation of a motion there for me. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to be specific as to what you need to do, but I think it gives them the flexibility to do that, and, and it comes into line with the original budget that was passed. And if we can do it, you know, based on the timelines, then I, I think we should do it. We, we go it to the system. Are you prepared to move such a motion? Absolutely, Mr. Chair. So, the motion would... Rick, you help me with the motion. I think the motion would read something to the effect that uh, of the projected surplus of one million dollars in forecast number three, that uh, an additional five hundred thousand dollars be allocated uh, for supporting the learning, whether it be real world learning or technical jobs, but supporting the initiatives of the director's work. Does that make sense? Okay. I, I believe so, and I, and I think at the end of the day, if, if administration can't perform it, then we have a surplus, so that's okay. But I think what we're saying is we're giving them the opportunity to go out and find uh, uh, places where we might be able to uh, support our systems uh, and bring our surplus down to the original pass of the motion. I'm supportive of it. Okay, I'm going to read that, that uh, I crafted. <laughs> we crafted. Well, no, it's all right, I'm just going to play with it a little bit here. So, work with me most if you can. That the Upper Canada District School Board direct administration to spend up to $500,000 of the projected accumulated surplus in forecast number three for the purposes of student support and um, upgrades. But the third one will do Okay. Hang on, we're, we're working on this, so we're going to take our time. When you speak, I can type pretty fast. When you say that? Okay. Yeah, if you speak, we're directly going to speak. It's been up to $500,000. I'll get to get it to the end of the surface. It's going to be a financial investment screen. Um, this is just to affect the in-year surplus. Yes. And 
because it's not going to be motion without putting the solid on the bottom and going to return us to our original estimate, which is probably 400,000. Well, this exactly does that. We have a $1 million projected surplus. Right. We're taking 500,000, allowing the director to allocate funds for his projects. And so we're back to 500,000. We have budgeted 400,000. Okay, so, so you're not going to draw any other numbers. If you want, if you want, we can make it 600,000, which would put us in line with the original projected surplus. Yeah, I'm like just in my interpretation was to say, we were going to go back to the original estimate of the past. Trustee McDonald? Yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, we also need to make sure that the director, you know, we need to spend the money knowing that we have to get the, the goods or services within the fiscal year. So, you know, he may come back to us and say, listen, we can only spend 300,000 of it, or we can spend five or 600,000 of it. So, you know, I think whether it's 500,000 or 600,000, we also need to make sure that we can, um, we can get the goods and services. So, you know, we can make it so that it's specific, but it also has to be uh, flexible in the sense that um, uh, we don't break any other rules or laws uh, by trying to spend the money. And it's important that we do spend it, but it needs to be done within the current year. Uh, Trustee Perryson. Thank you, three chair. I, I would continue on David's wording where uh, our Trustee McDonald's wording where we could say up to, therefore we're not locking the, the administration into a specific price value because what happens if they can't deliver, they can't buy, it just things can't necessarily always be delivered as why you purchase it and that way. And also if for whatever reason something happens, we need to have more transportation, we still have some money there to spend that. Like we're, we're kind of, you know, this is forecast number three and not forecast number four, so. Right, but before we get into debate on the motion, I just, I'm just trying to craft the motion here is is that the motion now reads and i'm not even not putting on for yet but the other just is still board direct administration to spend up to five hundred thousand of the projected cumulated surplus and financial forecast number three that sound satisfactory david it's your motion i'm i'm fine with that and, and if trustee mcpherson preferred it to be up to 600 i'm fine with that as well no, that's your first is okay with 500, he says. Okay, up to five then. I'm good with that. I, I, I don't know how to add it here, but I wanted to, I just wanted to declare that it, it will be part of the director's work plan and our strategic plan. Noted. Noted? Okay, I'm putting a motion on the floor now. All right. The ever candidate, pardon me. Sorry, was the second, the first agreement. Vice Chair Grant, yes, the second. I'll try to get there. The Denver Canada District School Board Director Administration to stand up to five hundred thousand dollars and projected to be in surplus and financial forecast number three. Moved by Trustee McDonald, seconded by Vice Chair Graham. Are there any questions? Further Second. questions? Second. Yes, uh Second Superintendent? I can't make a friendly amendment, but we just ask you to strike the word accumulated because we're dealing with the in year surplus as opposed to the So we'll take out accumulated. <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> You've heard the motion as amended by Just a suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any further discussion? If not, please cast your ballot online. That uh, motion carries. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Executive Superintendent Hobbs, for your report. Much appreciated. Very clear. And we are now going to move to an equally clear report, I am sure, by our student trustees. Thank you. And through you, Chair, to the board, over the past two weeks, June Trustee Ward and I's activities have been centered around our student senate meeting of April 29, 2022 and the formation of a new board award recognizing student leadership. Firstly, Trustee Elia and I co-chaired the Student Senate meeting of April 29th, 2020 to via Microsoft Teams. 
As trustees, we recall this meeting was scheduled to be in person, an in person event at the North Grenville Municipal, Municipal Center in Kempto. However, due to ongoing bus driver staffing shortages, which affected bus routes of our senators, Trustee Lee and I made the decision to make the Student Senate meeting an entirely virtual event with a condensed agenda. The Student Senate meeting began at 4 o'clock p.m. and was adjourned at 2 o'clock p.m., with the agenda consisting of several topics as well as guest speakers. The meeting began with the arrival of student senators, approval of agenda items, as well as an acknowledgement of traditional territories. We then proceeded with our next agenda item regarding a discussion about the Green Igloo fundraiser. We were able to welcome two guest speakers from the Green Igloo Foundation to join our conversation. One was the Chief Executive Officer of Green Igloo, um, Reagan Solovsky, and the second was the Marketing Director of Green Igloo, Paige, De Paige Deasley. Our student senators were able to engage in insightful discussion about their initiatives as well as were capable of asking any questions they had to our guest speakers. Through this discussion, Green Igloo informed us that all funds provided by the student senate will be used to help a small remote community in Ontario. The build will begin in July, and the charity will send us photos to allow the student senators to see the visual impact their fundraising efforts are having in bettering a community at hand. After the meeting, through a follow-up discussion with Green Igloo, they informed, of, informed of us of how immensely thrilled and proud they were of the work being done by students on our board. Following the Green Igloo discussion, we welcome our third guest speaker of the day, who sits to the right, Superintendent Perry, <laughs> to provide a presentation to the student senators on the health and wellness. Superintendent Perry, through his presentation, expressed the importance of gratitude as well as formal ways to maintain positive mental health by taking care of yourself, asking for help early, supporting your friends, and getting involved. In addition, Superintendent Perry made student senators aware to several resources that they could use and advertise within their school, such as Thrive Mental Health and Student Mental Health Ontario. All the student senators enjoyed Superintendent Perry's presentation immensely, and we'd like to thank Superintendent Perry for providing the presentation. Our next agenda item consisted around the discussion of Elementary Student Council's initiative. As mentioned previously to the board, we stated that we would bring back to the Student Senate the possibility of aiding our neighboring elementary schools with the development of their own elementary student councils. Through much open discussion, student senators agreed on the emphasis and importance of student leadership and providing such opportunities at a young age. They agreed that the development of elementary student councils would aid our young students to learn leadership skills that they can carry on and develop through the older grades. With this, we presented the Student Senate with a motion which reads as follows, that the 2021 to 2022 student senators aid their neighboring elementary schools with the formation of a student council for the following school year. This was moved by Christy Lee and Senator Thomas. Following our vote, we are excited to announce to the board that the motion carried unanimously and student senators are now aiding with the development of elementary student councils across the board. Finally, we concluded our Senate meeting with an open discussion period before adjournment. We recognize that our student senators are looking forward to an in-person meeting, but were able to adapt exceptionally well to the virtual model. We were able to have a very interactive meeting, which allowed for much discussion. Secondly, Trustee Ward and I have been working on a very exciting new initiative we would like to present to the board. For the past few months, Trustee Ward and I have been working on the formation of a board award for student leaders called the Student Trustees Dynamic Leader Award. This award will recognize both elementary and secondary students who demonstrate exemplary leadership skills in the school and community. It's getting measured. Um, so, all right, so we do have a bit of a presentation to present to the board tonight. So, to begin, some trustees around this table, as well as the director and several superintendents, have seen this presentation, so we'll keep it short and condensed. <laughs> However, um, <laughs> minus what is written on the screen, <laughs> the importance and concept of why we began this award process was firstly for student recognition across the board. Our board has several awards recognizing staff, educators, volunteers etc. Um, however, we do not have such an award regarded, regarded as prestigious for our students, recognizing them board wide at the board table as well. Um, secondly, we found through our work that we need a positive connection between senior administration trustees and the students, however, there is a gap. Therefore, this board, um, this award will help bridge that gap and bring positive student stories to the board table as well as to the senior team. Thirdly, increased representation of student voice and excellence. Um, is undoubtedly brought forward by this award as we will be recognizing students at a board level and continuously aiming to help them make a positive impact in their school environment by providing them examples of students who are doing the same thing. 
Fourthly, positive academic impact is possible with this award, as we all know around this award table that scholarships, bursaries, and resumes are getting much more competitive as they were in past years. And this award will put our students with an edge in leadership skills as they are greatly valued in the community at hand. Is the increased student morale is most likely the most important aspect of this award. As we recognize we are coming out of COVID-19 and things are starting to come back to normal, we recognize increased student mor morale will be much needed at the end of this pandemic and we're looking to start a new chapter within the school board and improvements which our students can also provide. So for the nominations and selection of this award, our target groups for this award, we would expect it to be all upper Canada district school board students in both elementary and secondary divisions. And for the criteria for nomination, all schools should nominate up to one individual they feel are best fit for the consideration of this award based on the following criteria. Number one, the student demonstrates continuous involvement in school activities, which enhance student life at school. Number two, the student has demonstrated the 10 character always traits of caring, courage, fairness, generosity, honesty, empathy, responsibility, perseverance, respect, and resilience continuously in their daily activities. Mm -hmm. Number three, the student aims to aid the community in which they reside through small or large actions which improve the quality of life around them or themselves and others. And number four, the student inspires their peers to get involved in the school environment and in leadership opportunities which will aid the school community and the world around them. As for the design and promotion of this award, the proposed name is the Upper Canada District School Board or UCSB Student Trustees Dynamic Leader Award. The dynamic is for a person who has a positive, positive attitude, who is full of energy, and has new ideas. They can be regarded as a dynamic leader who is passionate, strong, and lively. As for leader, a good leader is someone who communicates appropriately and motivates others to contribute their best efforts. And note this name, as far from our research goes, is not used in any other school boards. The format of this award would depend on budget, but our suggestion would be a large frame certificate or plaque, as they tend to be the safest version, especially in terms of students. They can also be placed on walls effectively and efficiently in most cases, as trophies or metal may require extra hanging material to be supported. And as for promotion, as an uprising initiative, it initially may be promoted through local newspapers, and it would further be promoted through Upper Canada District School Board social media, the Student Senate, and within elementary and secondary schools worldwide year-round. After much consulting of this award with our trustee mentors, the chair, the director, and superintendents, we finalized all aspects of the award. The original presentation stating the importance of this award, which was just presented, is also attached to our report for your viewing. The nominations will be done by the school staff and principal. The nomination link was sent to all principals describing the award, as well as the nomination deadline on May 10, 2022. The nomination deadline is May 20th, 2022. We will continue to update the board of this new initiative as it, progr as it progresses. Over the next two weeks, we are looking to continue previous efforts to connect with our student senators through our supplementary meeting this Friday, May 13, 2022, as well as discussing pressing matters students find and face in the UCDSB. Our next report to board will be May 25, 2022. We'll gladly answer any questions or take any comments at this time. Trustee McPherson. Thank you. Um, your new award will that compliment or you are aware that there's a trustee's character always award um, goes to all elementary schools, all secondary schools. Will this complement it, or will it? Oh, I'm trying to find the word here. Um, or supplement it? Oh, Greg Ferguson? Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out if either one is going to interfere with the other. To you, Mr. Chair, uh, the trustee uh, McPherson makes a good point, and this is something that was raised early on. We had these discussions, and what makes this distinct is the emphasis on student leadership, which the character always wore is separate from that. You can be uh, someone in your school who shows courage because uh, you know you had a tough time in your life, and so you get the trustee's character award, and you, you're demonstrating character throughout it. This award is separate because uh, student tr trustees were feeling this would be more about uh, students who demonstrate leadership and some sort of initiative in their community. The reason that you saw the character traits there is because uh, if someone's a leader in their community, but they have some character issues, that's probably not someone we want to give this award to. So um, uh, until we help them grow their character a little bit more. Uh, so that would be the distinguishing uh, factor. But uh, to your point, uh, yes, there already is that award that was discussed during that. So we felt that this was separate enough and different enough and highlighted the leadership capacity in our students uh, to warrant a separate award. Okay, that answers. 
word I was looking for was overlap. I have a question for you, Mr. Trustees. Um, is this one board award or is this one award for each school? This is one award for each school. Justin uh, Craig. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, are you too confident to be enough resources and accommodation in your school to reach out to all elementary schools when you go to expand the student center? Um, through your chair, so we do, seeing as how all, almost all of our elementary schools do act as feeder schools to our secondary schools, that link is already there. So we feel that we will simply be using that already existing relationship between our schools for simply for purposes. So it will be electronic communication? It could be electronic communication. I know for me, I'm just hop, skip, and a jump away from a couple of my feeder schools so I can visit them in person. It would be up to the discretion of the student senators and whatever works best. Okay. You're not asking for permission here. You're informing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. No. Uh, you've been called. <laughs> the director Ferguson, could you tell us what has been done to date with this award? Uh, sure, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Sorry, just uh, I found that quite humorous. Um, <laughs> I don't get to bring reports like that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yes, as uh, uh, the trustees, uh, student trustees mentioned in the presentation, an email has gone out to notify schools about this with a link and asking them to do it, uh, outlining the criteria. And as you also heard, there's been many meetings that have taken place uh, with the senior team uh, running, this, running this bias. So we do have different awards that are presented and that are given out uh, for staff and for volunteers, uh, as, as the student trustee said, and we, we feel this is a nice compliment to that. And I've certainly had feedback already from a number of principals that think that this is a great idea and they're happy to uh, uh, submit uh, someone. And I think it's very wise that each school gets to uh, submit someone. Each of our schools has leaders within them and uh, identifying one a year, I think is quite reasonable. And uh, I'm confident that our principals will be happy to, to take part in this new initiative. Great. Well, you have to move fast. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And good luck with this. Uh, yeah, we look for, forward to updates. We are now going to move to 1005, which is the annual Fulton planning session, and uh, that occurred last Saturday. And I'm going to turn this over to uh, Trustee first Chair of the group. Thank you. First off, uh, my apologies to Lisa. This was right on the top of my to do list, the written report, and I forgot about it until I seen it on the agenda here tonight. And my apologies. I've even got the template at home and I didn't fill in any of the, the letters. I also want to pass thanks on to everybody who helped make it a success. Um, and I took a bit of planning. Uh, it, was, it was a team. And uh, using the new team effort, things worked nicely. Um, I have to admit that. Two things took me by surprise that day. One, the sleepy little town of Maricol, like Mayberry RFD from my Andy Griffith days, felt like Grand Central Station in Toronto that morning. I, I didn't know so many people like yard sales. And my second thought was, when I stepped in the door to go up the stairs, Led Zeppelin for some reason popped in my head. All I could think about was stairway to heaven. <laughs> but we made it. Uh, we started off the day with a lovely uh, coffee and muffins to get us going. And the first one at that was Jennifer Ferry, our very own superintendent of mental health and wellness. And then Jen Curry, Dr. Jen Curry, who it is, turns out is a local. Person, comes from the big city of Addison. Um, she's our chief of psychology. And we had a lovely presentation and discussion. Uh, broke for her coffee and muffins again. And then Lisa Livingston, who believe it or not, has only worked for for two weeks and all of a sudden she's in front of the board of trustees. <laughs> and she was our newly hired mental health leader. 
I think the day was a success. There was ample discussion. Um, we had a really nice lunch downstairs. And then in the afternoon session, we continued our discussion on steel. And then we had an informal director's discussion with the director. All in all, what I consider a very successful planning day. The last comment I will make is I love the sound of laughter when people are meeting over serious objects. objects. It means that we're relaxed. It means that we're having fun and it means we're enjoying ourselves. When people enjoy themselves, they always do a great job. So closing, I want to thank everybody that helped make it a success. I want to thank everybody that took their time off that day to avoid the yard sales and the lovely spring weather and come out to our planning session. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my verbal report. Just me first who wants to make a comment. Director <laughs> 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 well, you gotta slap it again. Trustee McPherson's point. I just, yes, thank you through you, Chair. I just wanted to uh, uh, thank Trustee uh, McPherson uh, for all his work. It, he spends quite a bit of time planning for this and working with uh, all the people involved to make sure that it's a great success. And uh, we had another excellent day. Second one uh, this year, both were fantastic with two very different topics and uh, the professional development that occurs is great. And I want to thank all the trustees and the senior team for giving up their Saturday to do this. Uh, it was uh, time well spent and uh, uh, much appreciated. So uh, thank you, Trustee McPherson, for all your work and all your I echo those uh, comments uh, sincerely, and thank you, uh, Trustee McPherson, for all your work. With regard to your oversight and your report, uh, it's a good, good job that you are a member of this board and not a member of student senate. In fact, I don't think. You're <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we are now going to move ten oh six, which is the student mental health and wellness. And I'm turning this over to Superintendent Ken Perry. Sure. Um, just to repeat, of uh, the past three presentation that we um, presented on Saturday at the trustees planning session but well worth repeating I think so it's a message that uh, um, we all need to hear we all need to hear often so um, first slide yeah. uh, we start uh, with gratitude it's a practice I've really uh, become um, more intentional about this year and just being thankful and, and grateful for the opportunities that we have. And um, practicing gratitude really helps you notice the positive things, especially when things that uh, can tend to focus on the more negative aspects. So um, I'm very grateful to be able to do this presentation and I'll do it as many times as needs to be done to get this message out. And I'm also very grateful that uh, we see this as a message that's good for all of us. It was intended to be a student audience that I originally prepared this presentation for. And once again, I'm very grateful for the student trustees and the student senate to um, request this presentation and to bring this conversation to the board level. So thank you very much. My favorite slide is to talk about myself. Uh, so, um, and really I'm focusing on all the titles that I carry. A lot of them are informal. So um, I'm a daughter mother, sister, uh, wife, and everybody knows by now that I love to shop for shoes. I was doing that right before we came into the board meeting tonight. Um, love to watch Netflix, I love to travel, and I love to read. But what I'm most grateful for is the title I got to carry this year, which is Superintendent of Student Mental Health and Wellness, and ultimately grateful for the learning that I did to get me to where I am able to make this presentation now and for you tonight. So. Just a word about mental health. Um, just like physical health, mental health changes. And we go through periods when we don't feel mentally well. Throughout our life, we can identify times when our mental health has fluctuated. And it could be because of the loss of a loved one, a challenge at work, or various other life circumstances that may feel like they're out of our control. We all have mental health, and it might be helpful to think about mental health as a range or a continuum. On one end is the optimal on top of the world. Mental health and on the other is poor mental health. 
not everyone has mental illness. Mental illness, like mental health, can fluctuate. On one end of the continuum is no diagnosable mental illness, and on the other end is severe mental illness. When the mental health and mental illness continuums are put together, they create a dual continuum. It's also helpful to know that people who have been diagnosed with mental illness can still feel mentally well. And similarly, people who don't have a diagnosed mental illness can have low mental health and need help. And that's why getting treatment and support is essential. We like this video from the Canadian Association of Mental Health that it helps explain how mental health works. Mental health is an important part of our overall well-being and is something we all can play a role in addressing. It's a subject that deserves our attention. According to Statistics Canada, one in three Canadians will experience one of six mental illnesses or substance use disorders in their lifetime. Other research for the Mental Health Commission of Canada shows that in any given year, one in five Canadians will experience a mental illness or addiction. Awareness has been raised about the importance of helping those experiencing mental illness to get access to treatments that will improve their mental health. But what about the four in five, or 80% of the population, who will not experience a mental illness or an addiction? What about their mental health? Are they mentally healthy? First, what is mental health? There is some confusion about what mental health means and this can have an impact on how we address mental health. For example, a lot of people think that when we talk about mental health, we're talking about mental illness, that these subjects are one and the same. Really, mental health and mental illness are two different things. Mental illnesses are conditions where our thinking, mood, and behaviors severely and negatively impact how we function in our lives. Mental illnesses can include depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, and other mood disorders. Mental health, on the other hand, like the term health, is a positive concept. It relates to our ability to enjoy life and to manage it in ways that help us reach our goals and cope with stresses. It's a sense of spiritual and emotional well-being. This means Mental health is more than the absence of mental illness. Now, if mental health and mental illness are two different ideas, what's the relationship to one another? Sometimes people picture mental health and mental illness being two ends of a continuum, as if one is the opposite of the other. But a lot of research shows that we should think about mental health and mental illness as separate yet interconnected concepts that need to be looked at measured and responded to differently. We should think of them on two separate continua. So here's what the mental health and mental illness continua really look like. On the mental illness continuum, one end runs from severe mental illness to no mental illness. On the mental health continuum, one end runs from poor mental health to good mental health. This model shows that a person without mental illness is not necessarily mentally healthy. They may be feeling down or experiencing a high level of stress because of life circumstances. But it also shows us that we can all strive for good mental health, that even individuals with mental illness can have good mental health. Let me give you an example. This is Tara. Tara has been diagnosed with depression, a potentially severe mental illness. However, her depression is now under control. She's on medication and sees her psychotherapist regularly. She likes her job, feels capable of completing her work and is able to eat right, sleep well and exercise. She feels comfortable and respected in the places where she lives and works. And she feels like people in her life love her and understand her. Despite her mental illness, Tara has good mental health. So how do we promote mental health? How do we make more people mentally healthy? 
While there are things we can do to take care of our own mental health, the community where we live, work, and play has a big impact on our mental health. A community can promote mental health when its members have access to good jobs, incomes, and housing. A mentally healthy community makes people feel safe and secure and like they belong because it's inclusive of people with different ages, backgrounds, genders, languages, and sexualities. There are simple things that you can do to help create a community that is mentally healthy. Know and accept that everyone faces daily challenges. Get involved in your community and give back. Support and include different types of people in your community. Finally, there are many things that you can do to take care of your own mental health, whether you have a mental illness or not. Know and accept that life can be challenging. Create purpose in your life by learning and trying new activities, like starting a hobby and setting realistic goals. Create healthy, trusting relationships with people who accept and support you. Know and accept your strengths and weaknesses. Accept yourself and others. It's the basis of self-esteem. And learn to recognize and understand that you and others have good and bad feelings. By increasing good mental health, all of these things contribute to the overall health of Canadians. Like the World Health Organization famously said, there is no health without mental health. We want students to know that mental health at school starts with them. Mental health can seem like a big topic. It's hard to know where to start. Our best advice to students is to start with themselves. Helping students learn that they need to take the time to take care of their own mental health is a priority. It's a resource they all have, but just like physical health, it's not to be taken for granted. We remind students that, the, and Bradford talked about it in this trustee report, that the most important things that they can do is to take care of themselves, ask for help early, support their friends, and get involved. Care of yourself means that some taking care of yourself. Some of the things that we do for our physical health, like getting enough sleep, eating well, and minimizing screen time, are also good for our mental health. But there are other things we can do as well. It's important to do things that you enjoy, not because you have to or think you should, but because these things make you feel happy. What makes you happy may not be what others find fun, and that's okay. Take time out now and then. Being busy can be good, but being stressed all the time is not. Give yourself permission to rest and relax. Doing nothing is actually doing something. It's helping you build your strength for your next challenge. Help others. When you take time to be kind to others or get involved in something bigger than yourself, it can give your own mental health a boost. Small things that don't take a lot of your own energy can sometimes make a huge difference to someone else. Notice the good things. It's easy to get caught up in the negatives that happen, in life, instead, look for positive each day. Even in situations that might seem bad, be grateful for small things. Asking for help. The other important role for our students is to notice when they are feeling unwell and need to ask for help. And that happens, just like they would if they had an earache or a leg injury. Often it's hard for others to see emotional pain and they might not notice until things get really tough. Asking for help can be hard, but it can really help students and their friends if they reach out early on before things get harder. We all feel sad or anxious or angry now and then, so it is hard to know if how we are feeling is part of the normal ups and downs of life or something to get checked out. Some signs to watch for. We all go through times when we don't feel as mentally well. Changes in feelings and emotions are expected, and sometimes they affect how we act. But how do students know when they or a friend could use someone's help to get through a challenge? Some questions that they can reflect on. Is how thinking, how I'm thinking, feeling, or acting different for me? A change from how I used to be? Are my thoughts, emotions, or actions affecting my everyday life negatively? Have I been feeling this way for some time, like more than a couple of weeks? Am I dealing with my problems in an unhealthy way? Am I carrying too much by myself? If a student or their friend answers most of the yes to these questions, it's probably time to connect with an adult who can help. Reaching out can prevent problems from getting worse. If they're still not sure, and when students are wondering if they might need help with their mental health, they can always speak to a teacher or another trusted adult. 
like a parent, relative, principal, coach, faith leader, elder, or family doctor. They can also call Kids Help Phone and speak to a trained counselor to see if getting more help might be a good idea. They can speak with a counselor 24-7 by calling Kids Help Phone. It's important to know that students who are having thoughts of suicide or harming themselves is important. We remind them that there is always hope and that there are people ready and wanting to help. We encourage them to tell a caring adult that they need help. And if they need immediate assistance, we remind them to call 911, to speak with a counselor 24-7 by calling Kids Help Home or call local distress complaints. Most importantly, the message we want them to get is you are not alone. One thing we hear a lot about from kids is how much students care about their friends and their classmates. They want to know how to help a friend the right way. There are things they can do to listen and support when a friend is experiencing problems with their mental health, but it's really important that they know that they don't have to do this alone. Sometimes students take on too much when a friend is hurting. Their main job is to support a friend to get the help they need. The best, way student, the best thing students can do for their friends is to be there for them. Don't judge, don't try to fix them, just listen. Just like with our own mental health, changes in our friends' behaviors, thoughts, and emotions that seem to be intense or lasting a long time can be signs that they need more support. If a friend has said something that makes, makes or causes worry about their safety or the safety of other people, it's important that students talk to someone even if their friends have asked them not to. Students have the power to make a difference in school mental health. They can start by learning how to take care of their own mental health and learn how to support their friends, but they can also get involved with activities at their school, in the school board, or through provincial initiatives to help more students. Student voice matters. Students are eager to get involved to impact mental health at their school. They are encouraged to speak to their guidance counselor, principal, or vice principal about opportunities that already exist at their school or about ideas that they may have to create new opportunities. Many schools have Jack.org chapters. These are groups of young leaders who work year-round to identify and dismantle barriers to positive mental health in their communities. With training and mentorship from Jack.org staff, they organize mental health initiatives that are designed to meet the needs of their peers. Through these awareness and education initiatives, youth chapter leaders raise awareness, reduce stigma, encourage help seeking, and help build mentally healthy communities. One of the things students can do is to share their ideas and input about school mental health at a provincial level. School Mental Health Ontario works with a group called Wisdom to Action to gather student ideas about mental health in an initiative called Here Now On. High school students across Ontario join regional forums and participate in an online survey to help to shape the next steps in school mental health in Ontario. The input received is used to create a student mental health leadership strategy. The latest report will be released to school boards in the next month. Thrive SMH, Students for Mental Health, is a committee of students from across Ontario who work to inform the supports provided by School Mental Health Ontario are the kind of support students want and need. If students are interested in being part of Thrive, they can speak with their vice principal or principal and ask for help to contact our mental health leader. Gratitude is a great way to end. I'm grateful to be doing this work. I've learned about what we can all do to positively promote mental health and well-being. And I'm grateful to be building a mental health and leadership team that can help us to plan and lead students and staff to develop mental health leaders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Perry. Some of us have seen this three times. <laughs> some of us have seen it twice. <laughs> some of us have seen it once, and some have not seen it. Any questions, comments? <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for putting the spotlight on such an important topic and uh, showcasing what we in the Epic Bay are doing. So thank you. I'm going to move to uh, 1007, which is the report of the policy and work group. And I'll turn this over to uh, Vice Chair Craig. Thank you, Chair. Um, the report tonight will conclude uh, the policy review that was happening on the March 21st meeting. Uh, and it's the last of our 13, so that we'll be doing three tonight. Uh, our next meeting at Timely is on Monday of next week, where we will start another group of 13, we'll start the cycle all over again. Uh, again, the purpose is to make sure our policies are always up to date. 
and to complete all of our policies every two minute two year cycle. So uh, at the end of the, this meeting, at the, at the end of this school year, we should have completed the first year of our second set of uh, cycles. So tonight we are going to uh, do uh, policy uh, 429, which is on purchasing. Policy 445, which is on travel, hospitality, and expense reimbursement. And policy 450 on uh, corporate credit cards. And each of the committee members is ready to uh, move and uh, second motions, uh, Chair, in order to get them. Thank you. So motion number one, if moved by Trustee McDonald, second by Trustee Patty Zang, that the Upper Canada District School Board approve policy 429 purchasing as we do May 11, 2022. Trustee McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We uh, reviewed the policy, but as you see here, there are no changes being recommended at this time. Um, just submitting for uh, review, uh, approval of the review. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Seeing none, please cast your ballot. Motion carries. Motion number two. It's moved by uh, Trustee Penny Zane, seconded by Trustee Cran, with the Epidemic District School Board approved policy 445, travel hospitality and expense reimbursement as reviewed May 11, 2022. Trustee Penny Thank you. Through you, Chair, the policy committee met. We reviewed the policy and have no suggested changes at this time for this policy. Questions, comments? Seeing none, please pass your <coughs> motion carries. Motion number three, speak by Trustee Cram, seconded by Trustee McDonald, with the Epidemic District School Board approved policy 450, corporate credit cards as reviewed May 11, 2022. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, if the policy was reviewed, we feel it's up to date. Uh, it doesn't require any particular changes at this time. Questions, comments? Hearing none, please cast your vote. Motion carries. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we are at the conclusion of our meeting tonight. And I um, have a motion to adjourn. Moved by Trustee McCray, seconded by Trustee First Person. We have a candidate of the school board uh, adjourned on May 11, 2022, at uh, 8.43 p.m. Cast your ballots. Are you okay? I'm in favor. I'm in favor. Okay. That motion carries. So safe travels home, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for your participation.